In the last video, we looked at the starting point of explorer Juan Cabrillo's voyage and his less than favorable first contact with the natives of California. In this next episode, we will look at the rest of his journey and its shocking conclusion. Check out my first ever sponsor, MF Apparel. With MF Apparel, your clothes themselves can start a new conversation with their interesting images like no other designer in the business. MF Apparel has something for you to start your own fashion revolution. Using the link provided below to check out their website will help my channel immensely, and doubly so with making a purchase through it. MF Apparel. Push boundaries and inspire creativity. In early October, after leaving San Miguel, today's San Diego, Camarillo's fleet continued up the coast. He saw many smokes from fires and mountains in the interior, but he did not make immediate landfall. By dawn on the 7th of October, Carrillo's ships anchored in today's Southern Channel Island network. Having spotted the islands during the night before, sources vary if he set foot on today's San Clemente or Catalina, but it is most likely the latter, as the sources suggest Carrillo noted that the island was near seven leagues from shore, around the same distance Catalina is from the mainland. Carrillo formed a shore party and rowed towards the beach. As his men drew near, however, a large group of armed natives, the island Tongva, appeared seemingly out of nowhere. It is mentioned that the Spanish made some gesture of peace, and the natives reciprocated, putting away their weapons. A canoe is said to have met the Spanish on the water, and gifts were exchanged. This gave a much more amicable impression of this tribe to the Spanish than their first encounter. The Spanish were allowed to land on shore, and an elder in the tribe told Cabrillo through signs, again of Spaniards on the mainland. This mentioning of the Coronado expedition would become a common occurrence in the Cabrillo voyage, demonstrating the extended lines of communication and trade between tribes in North America, which is seldom explored when describing native cultures. Even though these natives seemed much more friendly, Cabrillo did not want a repeat of his last encounter. He left the island around midday and ordered his men to stay on the ships while he spent the rest of the afternoon planning his next move. The next day, the fleet traveled across the way to today's Los Angeles basin. He named the place he saw the Bahia de los Fumos, or the Bay of Smokes, no doubt witnessing the hundreds of domestic fires from the thousands of natives that inhabited the area. Some modern historians gave a theory that he might actually be describing wildfires, but this seems unlikely, as the source mentions smokes as an indicator of habitation during the whole voyage. The location of this Bay of Smokes has been disputed in modern times to have either been the present-day Santa Monica or San Pedro. But since Cabrillo describes beautiful plains and rolling hills, rather than swampy marsh and large coastal cliffs, it is more likely he is speaking of the former. Some curious natives in a close-by canoe drew near the ship. Cabrillo had his men seize them and did not let them leave until they gave more information about the region immediately to his front. He did not get much out of them other than they seemingly wanted peace, and once again, the same story of Spaniards in the mainland interior. The Coronado expedition was seeming to have an indirect effect on Cabrillo's voyage. Everywhere he went, the tribes had already heard the stories of the Spanish and most likely were also told of their violence towards the native peoples. We don't know if this was a factor, but for whatever reason, Cabrillo decided not to make a landing in the highly populated basin and continue northward. Near Ventura today, Cabrillo landed at a place where the homes of the natives, the Chumash people, reminded the crew of Spanish-style houses. Many large canoes, able to hold around a dozen people it is mentioned, came out to greet the Spanish. Gifts were exchanged, and everyone seemed to be in a jolly mood. The Spanish called this place the Village of Canoes. Once again, Cabrillo was told of white, bearded men in the interior, but that this time, they were only a few days travel away. Curious about this unknown group of Spaniards seemingly so close, the record states that two soldiers were sent into the interior in order to link up with this other group. Were these Spaniards who had gotten separated and lost from the Coronado expedition? Whatever the case, there is curiously no mention of the return of these two soldiers who were sent to find this phantom army. It is unknown what happened to Cabrillo's men, if this event even did occur at all. Cabrillo continued up the coast, meeting various tribes and learning the names of several villages. It almost seemed like every coastal tribe wanted to see the Spanish with their own eyes. They brought gifts for bartering, and Cabrillo gathered as much information as he could about the surrounding cultures and landscapes. He learned of the rich natural resources that California possessed, but unfortunately, no gold or transcontinental river. Near the modern town of Lompoc, Cabrillo's men named the area Cape Galera and stayed there for a few days due to stormy weather. Cabrillo notes that the languages of these tribes were all distinct, and that they had often fought many conflicts with one another. Towards the end of October, Cabrillo's fleet was encountering heavier weather and rougher seas, but they were determined to still travel as far north as they reasonably could. However, progress would be much slower. 
In fact, Cabrillo's ships had to travel back south for a short time to find the sufficient trees to make repairs due to recent storms. After the repairs were done, he continued up the coast, documenting many native customs and cultures along the way. By mid-November, Cabrillo's ships had made it as far north as Monterey Bay, but then a massive storm hit them. The winds pushed the ships in various directions, and even separated one of them from the main group. After a few days of fighting the storms, Cabrillo and the rest of his crew went looking for the lost ship in the direction of the northward blowing wind. They are believed to have passed the outlet of the Russian River near the inland town of present-day Santa Rosa. On November 15th, they spotted the lost ship and caught up with them. The source is unclear of which ship went missing, but the lost crew explained that it was rough sailing, but they managed to keep the ship from running into the rocks. The coastline here was full of dense woods, and they saw no sign of native habitation. It is believed at this point, as winter storms were growing in intensity and not wanting to risk the lives of his crew, Cabrillo turned back. And so, they began the trip south to Mexico. Sailing back was swift, as the Spanish were no longer fighting the current, and by December, he was already back in Southern California. Though making good progress, the seas were getting too rough, and Cabrillo realized that he would need to winter here and resupply while waiting for the season to pass. And an island seemed to offer more security than the mainland. It is at this point that many have debated for decades which island did Cabrillo and his men winter at. Smith's translation of the Spanish documents suggests that it was San Miguel Island in the Northern Channel Island system. Others contend that it was the islands of Santa Rosa, San Clemente, or San Nicolas. But since the original ship's logs were lost, there's no sure way to know. But the widest believed consensus I could find, that is also supported by the General Archives of the Indies in Spain, is the island of Catalina. This does make some sense in that Carrillo would have probably wanted to winter in a place where he felt the natives would be nice enough to let them stay for a few weeks, and his last encounter on the island went reasonably well. But regardless of where he was, the events that took place on the island would leave a lasting impression for future Spanish authorities. Smith's translation is virtually silent on what happened to Cabrillo and his men, but other sources give more information. Nobody knows what happened for sure, but it seems that while the natives were friendly at first, prolonged interaction between both groups took its toll. The Spanish must have given several offenses to the villages on the island and overstayed their welcome. And while there is no evidence for this, it has been rumored that a Spaniard or two tried to force themselves upon some of the women. This was the last straw. Cabrillo must have sensed something brewing and began moving his men and supplies to the ships. In late December, near Christmas Eve, Cabrillo's men were ambushed and chased back to the beach. Seeing this from his flagship, Cabrillo made a valiant effort to row back to the shore to save the remaining Spanish there. The choppy seas made it difficult to get to the ship, and the men must have been panicking. Cabrillo, once ashore, jumped out of his boat and tried to lead a defense, but no sooner did he leave the craft than he slipped on a jagged rock and split open his tibia, and may have even broken his arm as well. His men managed to get him back to the San Salvador, but Cabrillo's leg became infected with gangrene. After a few days of pain and fever, he passed away on January 3rd, 1543. He was said to have been buried somewhere on Catalina or San Clemente, but his grave has never been found. It is unrecorded if or how many Spaniards were killed or wounded in the attack, as Cabrillo's fate was the only one mentioned, but many suggest that a majority of the men were able to make it back to the ships alive, or were already on the vessels once the fighting started. Ship's pilot Bartolome Ferrer was given command right before Cabrillo died. Ferrer immediately sailed to the mainland coast and tried to find supplies there, as some were most likely lost in the ambush. But it was not easy, and it would take him weeks. Word must have spread long before the events on Catalina of the Spanish behavior. And while there were no more recorded attacks on the Spanish, many of the once generous coastal tribes did not seem willing to trade or give food to Ferrer. He was forced to travel up and down the coast, but even so, he still tried to document all he could about the natives. But the winter storms began to take their toll, and time was of the essence. In one storm in early February, Ferrer got temporarily lost, and soon after in yet another storm, one of the ships was again separated from the main fleet. The men began to grow cold and malnourished. A few crew members fell ill, and one died. Ferrer stopped back at the Chumash village of Canoes in early March to ask if they had seen the lost ship, but received no information. Probably getting desperate and frustrated at the turn of events, it is here the text expresses that he secured four natives and took sail. 
Ferrer also took two young boys off a nearby island, giving the excuse that they would be needed as translators for future expeditions. What happened to these unfortunate captives is not known. Realizing they could stay no longer, the Spanish frantically traveled south, stopping periodically every few days, hoping to run into the lost crew. And by March 26th, they finally met up with the lost ship at Cedros Island, off of Baja, California. On April 14th, after eight months at sea, they arrived back in New Spain from where they had set off, Navidad. During the expedition, Cabrillo noted that most of the natives were either naked or dressed in animal skins. He described a land rich in natural resources, but not much in the ways of gold or other precious items. This did not impress Spanish authorities and investors. Hostile tribes also did not enhance the image of the Pacific coastline either. While the land may have been good for growing food and building settlements, there seemed to be no other potential for it, and it lacked the massive riches and societal infrastructure that was already in place like Mexico and Peru. The amount of effort and money that would be needed to conquer the area and make it profitable to the Spanish was too much and would take too long. All this led to the determination that Alta California was not worth any time or investment. Other places of the Americas, and the recent news of the conquest of the Philippines near the markets in China seemed much more promising. Cabrillo's voyage did have one benefit for Spain, however, the powerful southern coastal current. Spanish merchants could travel from Mexico to the Philippines to China and then sail to Northern California to catch the swift current south back to Mexico, shortening trade journeys and increasing profits. But the California coast itself was largely ignored, not even warranting setting up permanent supply bases. Thus, while Alta California was claimed by the Spanish, it was in name only. Natives watching Spanish ships pass by from a distance, but never landing, became a common sight for the next 200 years. Please click the like button to help bring this video to new viewers, make sure you are subscribed for future historical content, and consider supporting the channel on Patreon. It helps pay the bills and for other features that allow me to spend more time and energy creating videos. Lastly, I would like to thank all my subscribers for continuing to support the channel, and a thank you to those who are here for the first time. I'm Eric the Lone Pine Wolfman, and remember, never stop learning.